Thank you very, very much. It's, it's very loud. It's, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, that is a wonderful hymnal. This is a wonderful bunch of people. I very much enjoyed myself the past uh, couple of days here. Um, I, I have to mention an incident that happened in South Carolina about a month and a half ago. And sadly, it involves some uh, gentlemen who would like to be president of our country. Um, I don't know how many of you attended a debate of Republican presidential candidates six weeks or so ago. Um, I, I say this without supporting a single one of them, recognizing that the ones that say good things also say horrible things, not intending to compel you to think that one of them is a good guy or a bad guy, but to look at, as almost as a parable, how our brothers and sisters who attended that debate think of the world. Uh, in that one of these candidates, uh, a gentleman named Ron Paul, described Pakistan as being a sovereign nation and suggested that the United States should maybe stop bombing it. He also proposed that there should have maybe been some attempt to capture Osama bin Laden rather than murdering him. He suggested that we might want to use the rule of law in the world and went so far as to advocate that the United States only fight wars that have been declared by our Congress, a standard that would eliminate the past 70 years of U.S. wars. And what do you think the response was from the crowd when he said these things? You're wrong, they cheered. They cheered, at least a section of that crowd cheered and another section was silent. You didn't, at least in the video on my computer, you don't hear any booing. And then Newt Gingrich spoke up and said that the proper thing to do with enemies is to kill them. And what do you think the response was to that? Ecstatic cheering, ecstatic cheering. And now what can, what can the first gentleman say in response? What can Ron Paul say back to that? I think he could have quoted anything from Jesus Christ, Ronald Reagan, Ayn Rand, and been booed. And he guaranteed himself to be booed because he, he opposed U.S. exceptionalism. He said that other nations might merit the same sort of respect as our nation. That in fact, if another nation were doing to us the things that we do to other nations, we wouldn't like it. We might want to apply the golden rule, he said, to our public policy. And they booed the golden rule. They booed the golden rule. And then the same guy goes on to speak against launching a war on Iran in support of ending all our current wars. And he's cheered. At least some group of people, maybe some of the same individuals who were just booing, cheer. Right? So I don't think that this audience dislikes the golden rule in personal relations. I don't think they dislike peace. I think they're neutral or positive on the idea of ending wars and avoiding more wars. I think what they object to is the notion that other people, that our national enemies, deserve any sort of respect. I think what they are fiercely opposed to is the idea of loving our national enemies, much less turning our nation's other cheek. I think they would be absolutely fine with avoiding wars if uppity foreign nations would learn their place in the world. Now, people may all have value in this sort of non-world view, but only one nation has any value, and that value is supreme. So you fall under suspicion of hostility towards this nation, and the proper treatment for you is murder. And you belong to another nation, and the loss of your life as collateral damage is of negligible importance. Now, I think that we often erroneously apply lessons from our personal relationships to politics. We try to think of elected officials as our friends rather than as, as our elected officials. We, we imagine 
them driven by emotions and social relations when they are being clearly driven by financial bribery and partisan pressures. But I don't think we're making that kind of mistake if we try to apply the golden rule to international relations. I think we're not analyzing what they are doing, we're suggesting what they ought to be doing. It is hard to argue that the golden rule ought not to guide our collective behavior toward other populations. That is to say, if we had a government that represented our wishes, we ought not to wish for it to treat large numbers of foreign people in ways that we would not like foreign nations to treat us. The golden rule in foreign relations conflicts dramatically with almost everything in U.S. foreign policy, from the Monroe Doctrine down through the Carter Doctrine right up to our kinetic overseas contingency operations and extraordinary renditions and indefinite detentions and enhanced interrogations and surgical strikes and all of the other weasel words that we use to mean the kidnapping and imprisonment and torture and murder of human beings. And that does not prove that the golden rule is wrong. On the contrary, it proves that our foreign policy is wrong. Our military is in over 150 other countries and we would not stand for anyone's military to be in our country and therefore we must get out of everyone else's. We bomb and invade and occupy nations that we falsely accuse of possessing weapons. We would never stand for being bombed and invaded and occupied even though we really do have those weapons. Therefore, we should stop doing that to other nations. We rain hell from the sky on families to protect women's rights and to spread freedom. But if our roofs were being blown off and our limbs as well, we would not feel we had gained any rights or any freedom. Therefore, we should stop treating war as an acceptable instrument of national policy. I think the Golden Rule is in fact an excellent guide to foreign policy. It even goes places that none of those candidates at that debate would go. I think it's of less help in domestic policy in that we have disagreements, right? All of us don't want to be bombed. On domestic policy, we have disagreements. We have to go with majority opinion and respect for individual rights. On foreign policy, we don't want to be occupied. We don't want to be bombed. We don't want a Chinese base in Texas. We should not be destroying the natural environment in Korea and Japan to surround China with our bases. I think it really is that simple. Um, that was an absolutely beautiful song that we heard. And I have not been able to figure out, the, the man who wrote that wrote it in 1950, and I have not been able to figure out what he knew. But the vision that he had in that song if you, leave the, if you leave the women out of it, if you make it a room full of men, the vision that he had in that song had already happened. It had happened on August 17, 1928. The leaders of all of the wealthy industrialized nations of the world had met in a room in Paris, France, and signed a treaty that said, there shall be no more war in the world. Our nations are forbidden to use war. They must settle all disputes by pacific means alone. This was called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, and it is still the law of the land. Under Article 6 of our Constitution, it is the supreme law of our land. It is on the State Department's website. Every war, the defensive wars, the humanitarian wars, the just wars, every single war has been illegal under this treaty. And I was interested in how, the world, how in the world this happened because it seems almost inconceivable today that you would get such a thing to happen. But it happened because a peace movement grew up in this country and other countries in the late 19th century that educated enough people so that when World War I happened, the response was dramatically different from how the response had been to other wars, much more so than can be explained by the difference in the, in the technology and the, and the style of that war. People had come to understand that war could and should be ended. Andrew Carnegie, 
one of the wealthiest of the robber barons, had funded with a massive amount of money an endowment for peace with the requirement that once they had eliminated war from the world, they would pick the second worst thing there was and begin working on eliminating that. This was the mindset of the peace movement at this time. And when World War I ended, the people who had already wanted to end all war wanted to do so even more. The people who believed the propaganda that it was a war to end war wanted to follow through on that. And the people who were outraged and resentful over the propaganda and the lies that had dragged this country into a foreign war wanted to avoid it in the future. And you could blame war on those backward Europeans. You could blame, you could be not just for peace but against wars without being treasonous in this country, as has been the case since World War II. And, and so there was a climate in which you had a peace movement led by Republican senators. You can try to imagine South Carolina's Republican senators leading a peace movement. This, this is what happened in the 1920s. You had bankers, you had robber barons, you had university presidents, you had a peace movement that was absolutely mainstream. You had women's groups that were new and hugely powerful and able to vote, pushing a peace movement. You had religious groups, you had every denomination, every collection of churches, publications like the Christian Century, pushing the ending of war. And you had, you had something of a divide in this country in that you had isolationists, to use a simplification, who wanted to just stay out of foreign troubles, and didn't want alliances of the sort that had caused World War I, wanted to avoid that. Uh, and they, they, if you look at what's resulted from NATO and other alliances since, they had some, some wisdom. And then you had those with a more European perspective who wanted the League of Nations and the World Court and all sorts of arbitration treaties and alliances. And you couldn't bring these two together. And so even though you had overwhelming majority demand for peace, you didn't have agreement on how to get it. And through the 20s, you had disarmament conferences that resulted in more armaments. You had the uh, League of Nations and the World Court rejected by the Senate. You, could, you weren't getting anywhere until a movement gained power that was called the outlawry movement, the movement to outlaw war. And this was started by a, a lawyer in Chicago named Samuel Oliver Levinson. Got a few of his friends, including Jane Addams, together around a table and said, let's make war illegal. War had been legal. After World War I, there were, there were trials for atrocities, but not for war, not for making war. War was not a crime. Nations were legally permitted to seize territory. That was legal. War was legal. He said, let's, let's get rid of it legally, and then maybe we'll actually get rid of it. Right? Because we got rid of blood feuds. We got rid of dueling. Right? And we didn't just get rid of aggressive dueling. We didn't keep defensive dueling. We said dueling is going to be put behind us. We're going to outgrow it. And this has, of course, been the trend for centuries. The use of war and violence has been going down in every way. Slavery, feuds, dueling, child abuse, spousal abuse, fist fights, uh, murder, uh, raising animals with violence. Violence in every way is leaving our culture. And many things that were, were treated as institutions that were natural orders of things, including slavery, had been done away with. So these people said, let's do away with the institution of war as something that's acceptable and legal. And this appealed to both parts of the peace movement. This appealed to everybody. And it was organized internationally. And you had, you have this absolute wealth of books and pamphlets and brochures from the 1920s that are forgotten because our history books jump from war to war. They leave out everything else, including major massive public movements to do things like end war that actually succeed in putting a law on the books that ends war. Well, this, this was major news in the 1920s. I'm not telling you you know, secret CIA history. This is just forgotten history. 
right? Frank Kellogg, who was the Republican Secretary of State, uh, in 1927 was cursing peace activists. 1928, he was working night and day to bring the nations of the world to the table in France to end war. And he never understood the vision of the outlawry movement. He never understood the, 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 the job of ridding the culture of war and establishing international law and international courts. He, he was doing what the public was forcing him to do. Aristide Briand, who was the French foreign minister, uh, wanted a treaty between the United States and France. He wanted the United States to jump in the next time France attacked somebody or was attacked. He, he wanted arbitration treaties and alliances. But he was brought into this because a, a U.S. professor from Columbia University, James Shotwell, went over to France and wrote for Mr. Briand a statement for the Associated Press addressed to the American people that showed up in U.S. newspapers that said, we need to do what your movement is demanding an outlaw war. He was doing what Wilson had advocated, public diplomacy. He couldn't get more public. He didn't go to the president. He went to the papers. And then nobody said anything back for weeks and weeks. So Shotwell's colleague, both of these guys working for Andrew Carnegie's Endowment for Peace, his colleague, the president of Columbia University, writes a response in the New York Times. And these guys go back and forth as ventriloquists for the French and US governments for a time. <laughs> and they build the pressure and draft the text and, and come up with a treaty that eventually becomes the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And it becomes it with lots of pressure from people like John Dewey and leading academics in this country, lots of pressure from women's groups and leadership from isolationist senators like William Bora from Idaho, who became chair of foreign relations despite never having been anywhere foreign, uh, right at the right moment, uh, and who, who, who was an isolationist, but who honestly wanted to end war and wanted a treaty that was not bilateral, but universal, that ended war, and thought that this notion of ending war with war was absolutely insane and counterproductive. And so there, these were isolationists who legitimately wanted peace. Um, by 1924, outlawing war was in the platform of four parties, Democratic, Republican, Progressive, and Socialist. It was pushed by President and President to be reelected, Coolidge. It was advocated by the, by the Baptists and the Methodists. It was, it, it, there was a peace made within the peace movement, or the leaders of the two sides of the peace movement publicly agreed on a compromise to make this happen. Uh, people like Senator Bora and, and Butler, the president of Columbia University, who were having public debates on whether we should legalize alcohol, <laughs> were united on whether we should outlaw war. Right? This, this brought everyone together. Um, you had resolutions in the Senate. You had endless public meetings and rallies and lobbying of the Senate. This didn't take civil disobedience. This took endless education and speaking events and lobbying and, and meetings and petition signings. And when Charles Lindbergh flew to France and France fought, fell in love with the United States, and when a number of Republican senators who wanted to be president started vying for who, have, who would have the resolution that would make the treaty, uh, and, and when Carrie Chapman Catt, who had led the part of the movement to get women to vote, but had sold out on World War I, as many did, prioritizing the right to vote, put the strength of thousands and thousands of women behind this, uh, and suffered a heart attack in the endless lobbying effort at the last minute in D.C. And when Secretary Kellogg got on board and outraged all of his underlings at the State Department who thought he had been just playing along, they didn't think he was actually serious, then you had that strangest dream. Then you had that meeting in Paris. And then you had the United States Senate have to ratify the thing. 
And this is where the world court failed, where the League of Nations failed, where everything good, where every effort to end slavery without a war failed. I mean, the United States Senate is the hurdle for anything decent in this world. It's harder than your local government, your state government, the House, the President, Fox News, foreign nations. I mean, the United States Senate is, you know, is, is the hardest hurdle. It was put there to be anti-democratic, and it is. And it passed this 85 to 1. It passed it 85 to 1 after numerous senators had taken the floor and denounced it. And they said, yes, but I didn't want to be lynched when I got back home to my state. And this was done with absolute racist hypocrisy. It left out the poor nations that were colonized by the threat of war. It was all the wealthy nations of the world. Uh, it was done uh, with men in that room in Paris, not women. Uh, but it was done in a very meaningful way, and the world understood war to have been outlawed. Frank Kellogg was given a Nobel Peace Prize. It was the biggest story in 1928, and wars were prevented, and wars were ended, and the non-recognition of gains from war, the, the right to seize territory, ceased from that moment to this. And when World War II came along, and the Kellogg Grand Pact was completely forgotten, and they were trying to figure out a way to prosecute the Germans and the Japanese when they won. There was a lawyer who dug up the Kellogg Grand Pact and said, look at this, and couldn't get anybody to listen to it, couldn't get academics to listen to it, couldn't get lawyers in the bureaucracy in DC to listen to it, but he had a friend who knew a friend who knew a guy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt said, this is what we're doing. And lo and behold, everybody said, oh, there really is a strong legal argument there. What do you know? And they prosecuted aggressive war with the bitterest of irony because the Kellogg-Briand Pact had been carefully created not to make the crime aggressive war, but to make the crime all war, any war. But this was Victor's justice, and it was far, far better than nothing. And the United States was pushing at that time for the rule of law in, in, in foreign affairs, as the United States now has become the leading opponent of the rule of law in foreign affairs. And the International Criminal Court will not address war as a crime until 2017 at the earliest, and then only crimes, not uh, only wars not authorized by the UN, or not favored by the United States, or not characterized as defensive. And this is the weakness of the UN Charter. The UN Charter bans war unless it's defensive or approved by the United Nations. These are loopholes you can drive many a war through. Yes. The Kellogg-Briand Pact is the piece of paper to hold up and show your friends. It is far better for counter-recruitment and for anti-war advocacy. We ought to have a holiday on August 27th. I think I said August 17th, it's August 27th. August 27th, 1928. We ought to have a holiday. Not because war is over, but because the first step was taken. Right? We still have murder, we still have theft, we still have coveting, but we, we give Moses some respect. We give people who put the first laws down some respect. These are people who understood it would take generations who understood this was a project like ending slavery, who understood that future citizens would have to pick up the baton and carry it forward, but who took a major, major first step in ending war. Uh, there's a, there's a, a bay and a window in the National Cathedral where the ashes of Frank Kellogg are, a peace bay with Martin Luther King honored there in the same place, and we ought to have a holiday. Uh, we ought to be looking at people who got the Nobel Peace Prize because they did something right. right? We ought to be taking the Nobel Peace Prize away from people who didn't do anything to earn it and giving it to people like Bradley Manning. World War II changed all this and it changed our thinking and it made us believe that it was naive and silly to try to end war. Because we had tried to end war, it was an idea whose time had come and then it had gone again. We hadn't done it. 
But there has not been a war between wealthy, armed nations since World War II. And had it not been for many freak occurrences, there would not have been World War II. War is going away, but at the same time, we have made this nation into a permanent war economy. We have done what Eisenhower warned against. We have given absolute war powers to a single individual, whoever is president. We've done what the founders of this nation warned against. So we should be looking back at what our grandparents and our great-grandparents did, because this was a popular movement that succeeded, that we can build on, that handed us a law, right? When they want to give corporations the right of free speech to spend money to buy our elections, they dig up little notes that were added in the margin of Supreme Court rulings a century before. When they want to legalize torture, they dig up interpretations of Federalist papers, stuff that's not law. We have a law that's on the books that we just have to print out and hold up. It fits on one page that says war is a crime. We ought to make use of that. I close with a comment that Howard Zinn, the great late Howard Zinn, said in 2006 on the National Mall at Camp Democracy, which was a, uh, an attempt to create an occupation uh, five or six years too soon. And he said, if there is anything we can accomplish, it should be making this next century the one in which war finally ends. So let's remember those who went before us. And I, I've never given a sermon before. I've always wanted to say this. Go forth and do likewise. <laughs> Thank you.